A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking towards them on the lake. But when the disciples saw he was walking on the lake, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why do you doubt? The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. This quote by the American President Franklin D. Roosevelt is arguably one of the best known and most repeated quotes by any modern politician. Spoken by Roosevelt at his inauguration ceremony in 1933, they stemmed from his own experience of fear and self-loathing when, in 1921 and at the age of 38, Roosevelt was crippled from the waist down by what doctors diagnosed as a rare case of adult polio. Roosevelt was at the time a healthy, active and ambitious man, a rising star in the world of American politics. But with his paralysis, it seemed to Roosevelt that all his dreams and ambitions had come to an end. He was deeply angered by the well-meaning sympathy of others and experienced a deep sense of shame because of the stigma attached to being a cripple. Roosevelt's mental health deteriorated, spiralling into a deep well of depression and humiliation. Fortunately for Roosevelt, he was saved by a physiotherapist who taught him how to change his mindset, how to overcome his denial and shame by accepting both his condition and the fact that his paralysis wasn't the irrevocable obstacle he had thought it to be. Likewise, having previously enjoyed a privileged and comfortable life because of his wealthy background, Roosevelt was confronted with his own prejudice towards the ill and the disabled a confrontation that evoked within him a genuine compassion for those who were forgotten or actively disadvantaged by the social and economic structures everyone else took for granted. As a result of these experiences, Roosevelt threw himself into politics, going on to become one of the greatest presidents in American history, one whom many historians regard as second only to Abraham Lincoln. And his observation about fear, spoken at his inauguration, was the realization that in the wake of his paralysis, what really crippled him was not his condition, but his fear. Fear of his own body, fear of the stigma directed at him by others, fear that his ambitions were lost, and most of all, fear of other people who were likewise disabled or afflicted by some other chronic condition. It was only by overcoming fear that Roosevelt was able to enter into the fullness of life. Roosevelt's story can be seen as inspirational, but ironically, it can also be seen as judgmental as some kind of impossible standard to live up to for other people in similar circumstances. 
Indeed, it can be seen as something which, if you don't emulate it in terms of the material and social success Roosevelt achieved, it indicates your failure as a human being, your inability to be really who you are because of your faithlessness and fear. And a similar problem arises when we consider passages such as today's reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. A simplistic reading of this passage usually provokes one of two responses, either that it's an impossible miracle story which we are ripe to dismiss as superstitious nonsense, or it's a judgmental morality play in which Peter proves yet again his unworthiness and lack of faith. This being the case, we either try to explain away the miracle by suggesting, among other things, that what really happened was that Jesus was walking along a sandbar which the water of the lake only just covered, so that he appeared to be walking on water, or else we conclude that the meaning of the passage is that we need to be better Christians by having perfect faith in God, and that it is only by having such perfect faith that we can hope to attain salvation. But the truth is that both of these responses are the products of fear. The first is the fear that, as people of faith, we may appear to be ridiculous and credulous to a sceptical modernity that doesn't believe in miracles and which regards faith as unscientific, the refuge of people too afraid to live in the real world. The second arises from the fear that either God or our fellow believers will judge us as not good enough and that our failings and limitations will somehow cause us to fall short of the mark so that we don't get our entry ticket into heaven. In other words, we respond to passages such as today's reading from the Gospel according to Matthew in the way we do because we are afraid, afraid of what other people might think of us, afraid of not being able to make sense of the text, afraid that it will reveal some flaw within us that exposes us to ridicule and shame which is deeply ironic, because it seems to me that the point of the text is to suggest to us the possibility of hope, that we, in fact, need not be afraid at all. So how do we approach this passage in a way that enables us to access this message of hope? I think we can begin by appreciating the wider context within which the symbolism in this passage falls. The image of Jesus walking across the water evokes passages from the Hebrew scriptures, especially in the Psalms and other texts such as Job, in which the Spirit of God moves across the deep waters of creation and of the world's oceans. Likewise, the stilling of the storm reflects passages from the Psalms and in Jonah, in which the sovereignty of God is depicted through the power to calm the raging sea. The extent to which the images in this particular passage might reflect or evoke images from the Hebrew scriptures might be debatable, but the point is they do not occur in a vacuum. They are part of the scriptural tradition of making theological statements about the Lordship of God over creation. And the purpose of such statements is not to try and either deflect questions of credibility or assert the divinity of Jesus through proof texts that attribute miraculous powers. Rather, it is through the use of powerful symbolism to draw our attention to the moment of transition of liberation and release that lies at the heart of the narrative. This moment resides not in our own power and capacity, but in the one whose power is the healing movement of compassion. <laughs>
for the Jewish people of Jesus' time as it had been for their ancestors, the sea or any other deep body of water was seen as a threat, as a place of danger and life-threatening power. Here be dragons didn't just represent an uncharted blank on a map. It spoke also of forces of nature over which humans had no control. The sea was linked to the abyss, a place of ultimate remove from the presence of God. So to drown at sea was, in a very real sense, to be lost to God. That's why the image of the storm at sea was so powerful. It was representative of the moment of ultimate hopelessness, of ultimate fear and lostness. In a very real sense, the image of the sea evokes the same fear which the inland deserts of Australia evoked for colonial society, a fear that persists to this day. The vast, mysterious sea of sand and rocky landscape into which people can disappear, never to be seen again. For Indigenous Australians, no such fear obtained. They understood and respected the power of the land and the natural elements. But to non-Indigenous people, the desert is a terrifying locale, a place of ultimate lostness and loss of hope. It is into this place of fear and hopelessness that Jesus arrives. Whether on the sea or in the desert is irrelevant. The power of God's compassion and love in the person of Christ penetrates even to the place of ultimate darkness and alienation. And Jesus' invitation to Peter that he walk on the water is not an invitation to assume or presume to God-like powers. Rather, it is an invitation to undertake the key task of discipleship, to point toward the one whose power is the power of love, whose capacity to intrude into our dark places and banish them with the light of compassion is the judgment not of condemnation, but of redemption and renewal. And the fact that Peter fails at this point the fact that he stumbles in response to this particular invitation is irrelevant. Because Jesus coming to his aid is emblematic of the fact that the invitation is never a one-off. It will always be renewed. It will always be reissued. And this is why Jesus' rebuke of Peter is not a condemnation of his lack of faith, but is instead a clarion call to open our eyes to the unconditional love of God. Jesus is telling Peter off, but not for the purpose of telling him he is not good enough. Rather, he is simply exhorting Peter, and by extension ourselves, to wake up to open our eyes to the possibility of hope, to view the world with the eyes of faith and trust, that we might see ourselves as God sees us, as worthy of love, as worthy of relationship, as worthy of being held in the light of compassion and grace. And the disciples do understand their reverencing of Jesus as the Son of God is not the convenient faith of those persuaded by evidence of miraculous power. Rather, it is the faith of those who realize that what they have been delivered from is not the power of wind and wave, but the depths of their own fear and anxiety. Yes, they will stumble in future. Yes, they will make mistakes. Yes, they will continue to be at times painfully human. But the realization of the absence of fear, of the powerlessness of despair, has transformed their lives. It is the moment of liberation and release.
So what are we to make of today's reading? Well, the first thing we should understand is that we are liberated from our fears about the text. We don't have to explain it away. We don't have to try and rationalize it or make it acceptable to others. And most of all, we don't have to fear what it might say about us and our alleged lack of faith. Because that isn't what the text is about. The second thing is that what today's reading from Matthew is about is nothing less than an invitation into discipleship and into the grace of unconditional love by which that invitation is accompanied. We are not going to be dropped into the deep end there to either flounder or prove our worth. Because what discipleship demands of us is not that we vindicate ourselves in the eyes of God or the world, but that we surrender ourselves to the possibility of hope. And in making this surrender, liberate ourselves from all the fears and anxieties that accompany the myth of the autonomous, self-realizing individual. The invitation into discipleship is an invitation into relationship with God. And as disciples, our task is not to be perfect, but to point to the one who is perfect, transformative love and compassion. Franklin D. Roosevelt, despite all his achievements, never completely managed to overcome his fear. It was a little known fact at the time, but Roosevelt was a serial philanderer and had numerous extramarital affairs, apparently in an attempt to prove to himself that his paralysis had not robbed him of his manhood. In other words, the fear that expressed itself in his sexual infidelity belies the myth of his superhero achievement. And yet despite this, the transformation that was worked in his life by someone who taught him to honestly address both his fear of others and of himself remained intact. And whatever the small failings of our own humanity, what remains intact is God's unconditional love for us all and the invitation into a life of faith which, while never perfect, nonetheless sets us free. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.